One of the most exciting things to happen to software development in the last 10 years has been the explosion of machine learning. It has changed the applications we're building, and it has changed the way we're building those applications. Today, I'm excited to have not one, not two, but three GitLab speakers talking about how AI and ML fit into the GitLab platform including a discussion of a recent acquisition, our plans to incorporate ML into our platform, and also our plans to help you incorporate ML into your apps as well. So please help me give a warm commit welcome to Monmayori Ray, Taylor McCaslin, and David DeSanto. My name is David DeSanto. I'm Senior Director of Product Management for our dev and sec sections of our portfolio. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Uh, my name is Mon Ray, and I am part of the Partner Product Marketing Team at GitLab. Hi, everyone. My name is Taylor McCaslin, and I'm a Principal Product Manager here at GitLab working on our ML work. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mon and Taylor. Before we get started here, I just wanted to give a, a, pre, a brief uh, PSA here for everyone. So of course this presentation and all of its link contents are gonna to relate to our upcoming projects and products and our new functionality. It's important to realize this content is presented for informational purposes only and should not be used for planning or purchasing decisions. As with all projects, you know, this may change. GitLab, we plan very ambitiously, so please, uh, keep that in mind as we go through this and that uh, we may change any plans at any given time. Um, now that we've concluded our public service announcement, let's hop in and talk a little bit about what the ML is up with AI and DevOps. So to kind of kick us off, I want to talk a little bit about the journey we took to get here. Model ops is a newer term in the MLAI market, so it might not be something you're familiar with. So to kind of explain what is model ops, let's talk about what makes model ops happen. So when you talk about the components of model ops today, the first is data ops. Data ops is the processing of data workloads. This includes ELT or ETL, whichever version of the term you're familiar with. In data ops, you are collecting data from multiple sources, aggregating it into a unified format, and then you manipulate, clean, and verify it before you use it. The next part is ML ops or machine learning ops. In this, you're taking that data you collected and you're preparing models for production. This includes model experimentation and training, as well as testing and deploying those models, both partial deploy and partial rollbacks. There's a newer component that people talk about when talking about model ops, and that is applied machine learning. So this is where your data, your ML model, and your application all get together to accomplish use cases. And these use cases can include everything from improved user experience. You see that today when using things like Google Docs, where it makes recommendations on what you should say next and it auto corrects things. That's all powered by machine learning. Also financial forecasting, large organizations that do investments will use machine learning to be able to pick out what they should put their bets on. And of course, trends and analysis, things like healthcare studies and those sort of things are all uses of applied machine learning. And of course, lots of other things as well. However, with the way model ops happens today, there's a couple of pitfalls and common pitfalls, I would say. Teams use specialized tools, and I put that in quotes, because what ends up happening is they choose tools that they're comfortable with that may not integrate with another tool. And when that happens, you end up with teams working in silos. Your data scientists aren't talking to data engineers. They're not talking to DevOps engineers. They're not talking to software engineers and security people. And before you know it, everyone's in their specialized tools. And you end up with things like handoff friction, finger pointing. It's not my mistake. It's the other person's mistake. You also end up with some other things that don't always jump out, like guesswork, unpredictability. Is this going to work? And the sad part of that is the outcome is sometimes the application doesn't know how to use the data well at all. And that could be the big disconnect that's going to impact you. The other part of this, and this is near and dear to my heart, as well as Vaughn and Taylor, is security becomes an afterthought. And you can think about how dangerous that could be. You're analyzing a lot of data. That data could have healthcare information in it, financial information in it, 
And somebody can end up with escalated privileges or worse, you could have a data breach and could tie back to how you're handling your data and your machine learning. And this is like the age old thing that happens and you want to avoid is, you know, you finish the work and it's not working. You go, well, I'm, I mean, my computer worked great. So clearly it's not my team. It must've been the other team. Like they should look at what they did. And of course that goes back to that finger pointing again. So what we want to talk to you about today is really the model ops of tomorrow. And we consider that actually here today, which is the exciting thing. What you need is to be able to have visibility, efficiency, and collaboration across those teams that are working on MLAI within your organization. When you have collaboration, visibility, efficiency, you have your team starting to work together. And that enables seamless collaboration. Instead of people looking out and pointing at the other person, they begin to work closely together. And we see that today with just traditional DevOps where security people are now working side by side with developers for a common goal. You actually enable teams to feel empowered to act. They no longer feel blocked by someone else. They can go ahead and do what they need to do. Security can be baked in from day one. You can actually have conversations about who needs the, the least amount of privileges, how do we implement that in, and it's not something happening at the end. And of course, this gives you those defensible and repeatable actions, great for compliance. And lastly, and maybe the most important to a lot of you, is your applications will know how to use the data, use it well, and you'll get the best result. And how we see that model ops tomorrow happening is the combination of model ops with DevOps. So if you actually then take DevOps and you label it or layer it over those three pillars we talked about earlier, you start getting a lot of the benefits from years of development and effort within DevOps. Some examples are version control. You can now version control your models, even your data sets, using things like Git and having that type of version control that's gonna be powerful for you. Continuous integration of your data science workloads into your models as you train them at scale. DevOps is great for being able to have baked in testing capabilities, and you can use those to validate your ML models to make sure they're ready for deployment. And of course, when you get to that applied ML side, you wanna have continuous delivery of your ML models. That way you can do things like partial rollouts, partial rollbacks as you need to. And of course, because you're doing it this way, you end up with your developers working side by side with your data scientists and your data engineer teams. And because of that, you know your application is gonna be able to handle those workloads properly when it hits production. And then lastly, and I would definitely not say the least important, you end up with good collaboration across development, operations, data, and your security teams. And now that collaboration is just going to make everything better for you. So today we want to talk to you about GitLab's newest stage in our single platform for the entire DevSecOps lifecycle, and that is Model Ops. I know, very unique name. We tried really hard and we like it. And so with that, we are going to focus on some things in the uh, near term here, which Taylor is going to talk to you about. Uh, we're looking at building ML Ops functionality into the GitLab platform. This will empower data scientists to run their workloads as part of a traditional CI pipeline. We're also beginning to look at leveraging applied machine learning within GitLab to improve our user experience. And as those areas mature, we'll begin to look at data ops functionality coming to GitLab as well. And in the short term, where we've partnered with Meltano, recently started up startup focused on data ops, on how GitLab and Meltano can talk to each other for data ops. So before I hand it over to Taylor to talk to you about all the cool things we're doing right now and where we're going, I did want to highlight something. In June, we acquired a company named Unreview, and you can see there on the right, the press release. We did this to begin adding applied machine learning functionality into the DevOps platform we have today. And Unreview is focused on developer experience and improving code review. And it does that by leveraging knowledge within Git to be able to assign the right code reviewer and there's a lot of cool things that go with that, which I'll let Taylor share with you. So with that, I'm going to transition it over to Taylor to talk about our plans. Awesome. Thanks, David. It was a great overview of our model ops stage. And now I want to take you through what our plans look like today and where we're headed in the future. So to start, I want to talk a little bit about the applied ML group that David had mentioned. Applied ML for us is really 
trying to enrich GitLab features with data science capabilities. We see that as three different areas of our product initially. The first one being automated portfolio management, which is really about how can we leverage data science to help you predict and track portfolio changes managed within GitLab. The second is insider threat. We want to uh, leverage machine learning capabilities to help identify anomalous user and CI behavior to help stop threats before they become a problem within your GitLab instance. And then finally, we want to leverage this knowledge and understanding of deep source code management and CI CD data to really power the future of uh, code security. Uh, we offer uh, security scanning capabilities today, and we want to enrich that with data science capabilities to really um, allow us to detect more advanced types of vulnerability in your source code. So all of these things together will be the various areas that we're going to be looking at of actually using data science capabilities to enrich existing and new capabilities within GitLab. And David talked a bit about our acquisition of Unreview. That's one of our first steps as we move towards automated portfolio management. We're thinking about this really in the sense of recommendation engines. We have a lot of data about your um, epics and issues and how those progress through various stages of your development cycle, how that ties into your source code, and how that progresses through your CI and CD processes. So we want to leverage the core data that we have about your development practice and push that through machine learning models to help do things like suggesting labels or suggesting appropriate code reviewers for specific types of code changes. We also want to enable smart defaults for GitLab. Based on the type of project you've got, the type of workflow that you're using, we want to change the way that GitLab works um, so that you have to do less configuration and you can focus really on the products, features, functionality, and code that you're contributing within the GitLab platform. And then finally, we also want to do things like code navigation. When you think about the extensive uh, series of developer tools that GitLab offers, we want to make all of those things smarter. And that is really one of the reasons why we acquired Unreview, is this is about us starting to think about how do we actually leverage data science to deliver very real capabilities that our customers like you are looking for. We've seen it in the news and on Twitter where companies go and talk about machine learning and artificial intelligence and deep learning, and it doesn't actually add up to anything for, for product features. It's just buzzwords on the internet. We really wanted to take a lens through this problem and say, what are the biggest challenges facing our customers today? One of those that we've heard is code reviewers. So today, GitLab actually offers a code review functionality where you can choose a reviewer. It'll notify them of your code changes. They can approve them or provide suggestions um, and feedback to the original author. But today, you have to manually choose who those people are. Um, part of the acquisition of Unreview was this is a really great opportunity to leverage the data that we have as a source code management platform, your commit graph of a particular repository, and leverage that to smartly recommend who might be a reasonable person um, and a knowledgeable person to actually review your code. And that's exactly what Unreview does, is it leverages that source code uh, contribution graph to recommend who is knowledgeable and who may have previously interacted um, with specific code changes. So we're looking to integrate this directly into our code review functionality today. Um, this is really about us trying to get familiar with developing machine learning models and deploying those within GitLab to enrich GitLab features. But this also strategically sets the stage for us to deliver on model ops um, and uh, the ML ops and data ops uh, capabilities as well. Because at GitLab, we dog food everything we do. We build GitLab with GitLab. So as we build this feature and functionality in, we'll be building out data ops and machine learning op capabilities within the GitLab platform, which will roll into those other stages that David had talked about. I briefly want to talk about two other areas that we're going to extend here, insider threat and intelligent code security. We're starting 
starting with automated portfolio management. And we'll leverage that as a first use case to really um, get our hands dirty and understand how to actually interact with the core data that exists within the GitLab platform, and then really expand that to these other use cases. For our insider threat capability, we're really looking at abuse detection. When you think about GitLab, your source code management, your CICD, there's a lot of things that can be abused here um, for spam, malicious users, um, certainly uh, issues with people spinning up crypto miners, bot activity, especially if you're opening and working on open source repositories. We want to help leverage all of that core data within our platform to reduce abuse of the platform, as well as let you focus more on what you're trying to deliver. Um, eventually, we'll move that to entity, uh, user entity behavior analytics, UEBA, um, and focus on anomaly detection and correlation between events happening with inside uh, your GitLab instance. And then finally, the intelligent code security piece. We want to take that deep knowledge that we have about how your code is developed, how it changes over time, and the security vulnerabilities that we're detecting in that source code, um, and leverage that at scale with machine learning to really detect deeper uh, security vulnerabilities, um, detect vulnerabilities at scale across the entire GitLab uh, ecosystem, all code that's contributed to GitLab, and really power the future of our security scanning engines. We want to do things like detect, not only detect security vulnerabilities, but also suggest code changes to remediate those. And when you think about it, as a source code management and CICD platform, when we suggest those code changes, we can actually push them into your repository, we can run your CI CD, make sure you've got passing builds, um, make sure that those security vulnerabilities are remediated, and then actually provide you a MR to merge with those code changes. There's lots of interesting capabilities that we'll be able to really enrich our existing capabilities to um, leverage machine learning techniques to really make our platform smarter and more intelligent so that you can focus on contributing. So that's an overview of our applied ML functionality. And as I mentioned, as we're developing all of these capabilities, we're going to be building out data ops and ML ops functionality. Data ops is really about how do you get your data connected to the GitLab CI CD platform so that you can start running uh, CI jobs that are training models, developing models. Um, you'll see a little bit of that here in a moment from Mon as she talks about what we've seen from the field uh, and what capabilities our customers are looking for. When I think about data ops and ML ops, it's really about delivering capabilities within the GitLab platform for data science workloads. And so on that data ops side, David had mentioned that we were working with a startup uh, called Meltano to really allow you to connect disparate data sources and provide access to those within a GitLab CI pipeline so that you can then build jobs on top of it. Meltano also supports ELT or um, ETL uh, data pipelines so that you can transform that data and interact with it and get it into the right shape and form to then run data science models on top of it, and then hand that over to the ML ops side where we really want to enable tool chain integrations with popular data science libraries like TensorFlow, CoreML, PyTorch, and others. We want to provide a really great experience for data scientists who may not be super familiar with, with CI CD platforms to be able to quickly get started with CI jobs that run their machine learning workloads to uh, develop, to explore, to train models, and then deploy those to production. Mon will talk about a little bit about the, the way that we see that developing in the future. And I want to touch briefly on some of the things that we're doing to actually enable this today. Um, as we think about trying to expose new compute options to GitLab Runner and uh, make those available to the CI platform, um, we've actually expanded uh, GitLab Runner to support GPUs. So you can actually run a 
a ML job that requires a GPU with GitLab Runner. Uh, we expose the capability to customize and access that GPU so that you can train your models or do other GPU intensive tasks within GitLab Runner. And you can see how we're really trying to bridge the gap between data scientists and DevOps to where data science can work in the platform where you're already deploying and developing your source code. Um, so that's how we're starting today. And now I want to hand it over to my to give us a look at what we're hearing from our customers. Mon, take it away. Thanks, Taylor, and thanks, David, too. Uh, so we have a good understanding of our plans for today and tomorrow. And now from the field, um, the findings from the field is based on uh, what we're seeing from our customers already uh, using GitLab or want to consider GitLab for the new addition uh, in your DevOps platform of deploying machine learning models. So from MLOps stack, uh, based on the customers, we've put it down to 11 different areas where our customers would like some uh, help or have challenges. It goes all the way from starting from the value proposition to data sourcing and versioning of the data then going into the data scientist workload of analyzing, experiment management, and then finally helping with retraining, uh, storing the features uh, into feature stores, going into then the code repository, having an orchestration CI/CD pipeline running from that data to the feature engineering, to the retraining, then to model deployment, model registry versioning, uh, prediction services, and Finally, the monitoring and metadata store. So all in all, all of these complex areas make that full MLOP stack. And each of these individual pillars is where our customers are looking for uh, tools to help through that journey to taking that machine learning model from a POC perspective to scaling it and actually being able to impact and have business value uh, through that process. Further, um, there is still a choice of what kind of platform you would want. Uh, it's all in three different areas. Would it be the cloud? Would it be managed? Or would it be in-house uh, machine learning uh, implementation? Uh, when it comes to clouds, uh, looking into what serverless uh, can mean for MLOps can be quite different to actually having managed servers where you are implementing an end-to-end -end platform such as Data Robot or Pachyderm or other AutoML tools, uh, and then having that in-house full management of it using just all open source models, but having the full orchestration of deploying that open source model. Now, the first part that uh, the customers ask is really uh, about how do we actually enable ML models as product? By that, it's not just the data scientists or the developers or, or just uh, or, or data engineers uh, collaborating together. It's beyond that. Uh, so this is just an example where it's the product, the scientists, the DevOps, the security team, all of it coming together, speaking the same language or having a tool, being able to translate the workload and the language to enable that continuous collaboration. So that's kind of that first customer ask that we see where uh, they come to, uh, we come to GitLab to really understand that full flow of continuous model ops without any friction. The second part is really then going into more on these MLOps pillars. Um, there are three areas mainly, where, which is first the data and features. That is part of what uh, David and Taylor talked about, the data ops. Really, the questions come out is where the data is coming from, versioning of the data, um, how do I actually have a uh, monitor bad reproducibility practice, all of that as part of that data and features. The next part is about the models, really how to build that continuous integration and deployment of models, how to choose that best platform when there's so many different tools, uh, being able to do auto ML, uh, feature stores, what is that choice of tools 
to really be able to take that model from idea to production and lower the cost of prediction and the best practices to retrain the model seamlessly. The third part is the monitoring and tracking of it. Um, we've, uh, we've seen uh, various kinds where there is manual tracking that's done in uh, even uh, sheets, Google Sheets uh, to uh, Excel files. So really taking that to the next level because uh, going from that POC to actually building scalable models, there needs to be better ways to monitor or track from the production to all the configuration to, to the storage, all of that having a better uh, uh, framework to track it. So to sum that all off, it's really into these three sort of areas where um, you're looking into a, the experience to be more personalized, uh, which helps with supporting no matter what kind of frameworks of models, whether a data scientist wants to work with PyTorch or TensorFlow, or, uh, or looking into uh, even a language, whether it's Python, R, or, Ju or Julia. So having that personalized experience, um, as well as giving that infrastructure uh, personalized experience for the ML lifecycle. Uh, then making it seamless. So ensuring that model security and integration, the CI, CD, all the way from data ops to model uh, uh, ML ops to applied ML, all of that, uh, having that seamless journey for it. And then the last part is really about that uh, freedom where people don't have to worry about uh, scanning Python packages or, uh, or actually data scientists don't have to worry about that version control or, or, or being able to not have uh, the explainability of it or spending time in figuring out how, how to explain and govern the model and giving them, uh, giving the tool to be able to do that and giving the data scientists the freedom to actually uh, do what they're supposed to do in actually building these um, models. So in reference to this then, uh, we've staged it into these five different sort of areas where uh, our customers are and a lot of it, uh, it, it it can all depend on the domain or, or even geography location or, or wherever that stage is. The five stages are where there is literally no, no ML ops. So most of it is done through traditional uh, manual building and training model. Um, most of the models exist as black boxes and the teams are in silo. Uh, then there's the second and third part, which is DevOps, but no MLOps and continuous training where a lot of our customers are sort of kind of there. They're already using uh, GitLab for DevOps. And now the DevOps engineers have not just to deploy a Java or uh, code, but also they have this new entry, which is to deploy machine learning models and how can actually uh, have those similar DevOps practice, how can we use that to actually help deploying this new uh, new framework in this ecosystem? So there's DevOps, but no MLOps. And then there's continuous training where there's a little bit of, we've already started using those DevOps practice within the MLOps. We've looked into looking into the reproducibility of the models. Uh, some of the manual work is already taken out and there's a little bit of continuous training and model management. A lot of our customers are kind of in those two different boxes. And then it's all about then taking it to the next level of having that continuous model deployment where with every new data you're getting in, you're able to actually track that data, which is quite, which can be quite different to the training data um, and being able to feed that and have that full traceability of post uh, production uh, continuous feedback loop as well. And the final stage is that having all of that fully orchestrated from data ops to model ops, um, giving the sense of alerts with data drifts or, or, or model accuracy uh, drop and having that sort of zero downtime system where there's not a lot of time uh, built uh, in, in, in that operationing, uh, operationalizing of models, but more about uh, actually focusing on the business case and building value-based models. 
When it comes to what we have already uh, talked about, so Taylor talked about our GitLab runners, uh, how we've enabled GPU. This is just a rough architecture of that, how that can actually help. So GitLab can, uh, with our CI service, can trigger the pipeline and continuously integrate these changes. So all the way from the source code to CI service, to using uh, the GPU in GitLab Laro to train the models, we can help with that CI CD of the ML ops, and that can be integrated to your front end, your model serving um, service, or the object storing uh, services as well. So that's just a rough overview of the GitLab CI for ML ops. And this is sort of just all the sort of findings that we have from the last year from our customers. And then with understanding our customer voices, uh, having a direction of model ops, uh, knowing our different uh, areas we want to focus on. So uh, we've looked into what our customers are looking for in GitLab, as well as we have a direction of a model ops stage. And so with that, we are starting to look into hiring as well. Uh, we're looking for all sorts of uh, roles from uh, product managers to engineers to developers to security, QA, site reliability, all sorts of engineers. So really, really recommend people if we are keen and interested in taking GitLab to that next direction in model ops to go into our career op opportunity pages and, and be able to apply for the role and help us uh, build the model ops stage. So thank you, everyone. And thanks, David, Taylor. And thank you for uh, listening to us.